Hey, good morning. Welcome to another Church at Home here at Hope for the Nations. Pastor Levi here. We're so glad and thankful you would join with us today. Uh, I just want to let you guys know that we love you. We miss you. We're praying for you. And we are going to continue on in our series on unity this morning. But before we do, let's prepare our hearts and enter into a time of worship together.
Amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, again, we're continuing on in our series on unity this morning, and we're going to the book of beginnings. That's right, the book of Genesis this morning. We're not going to go right to the very beginning of Genesis, but we are going to be in chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, and just to kind of give us a heads up, this story for the most part is a negative story, but it's an interesting story for us because even though it's a negative story, things that we can look into this, this text and, things, and find things that we shouldn't do, there's actually one thing in this story that we should do, all right? And it's that key component that I want to pull out for us today as we focus on unity this morning. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis, very easy book to find. It's the first book of the Bible, and we're going to be in chapter 11, reading from verses 1 through 9. And the story we're going to be reading is the Tower of Babel. It says, verse 1, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make a bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had a brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of of the earth. Amen. This story in Genesis 11 is kind of the biblical explanation for all the different languages we now see throughout the world. And even though this story speaks of kind of a humanity in defiance to God, we find something compelling, something that is a key component to unity, something that we can actually learn from in a good way from these people from this story of the Tower of Babel. And what we are, what we are able to see from the very beginning is that there was a, a, a powerful unity through their communication. They had unity through their words. This morning, I want to talk to us on the importance of our words. Throughout this series, we have kind of brought up that we as believers, we have a choice. That as believers that we have, we have been able to um, come into this relationship with Jesus and we were able to have a choice in it. Same with unity. To have unity takes a choice. That we have a choice on our part that we have to make if we want to be in unity with other brothers and sisters in Christ. That a choice is something that we must make continually to not only be in unity, but to stay in unity. The same thing applies with our words. That we have a choice with our words. We have a choice on how we use our words. And we must know that unity must be intentionally created. It must, we must have, uh, we must go towards unity intentionally. Same with our words. We need to use our words intentionally. That we have a responsibility on our part in a way to maintain unity. And as we maintain that unity, we need to be able to communicate to maintain it. How we communicate is essential, not only in this church, it's essential in, in marriages, it's essential, it's essential and important in families, it's important in workplaces, in society, and in community as whole. Know that God created us for community, right? Community is something that God created for us, that he created us for godly relationships, first and foremost with him and also for others that we see God as a whole, the triune being of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's, he's kind of like the, 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 the person 
this, that God is, is this person that we can look to to find true, healthy unity and community all within himself. And that is what we are as, as, as human beings, that we were created in his image. So we are not only created for community, but we're also communi- are created for communication, for language, for, speak, for speaking. So if godly relationships are to be important, then communication is to be the lifeblood of our relationship. There was an emperor by the name of Frederick II um, who ruled the Holy Roman Empire in the Middle Ages. It was from the, the mid-1100s to about the, the, no, the late 1100s to the mid-1200s. And so what he was trying to do is he wanted to find out man's original language. What was the language that Adam and Eve spoke when they were created being the original human beings? So he reasoned that if infants had never heard any words spoken to them, that they would eventually speak this this language um, naturally to them, all right? So what he did is he arranged for some newborns to be taken care of by some nurses and some midwives. And he gave them these strict instructions not to communicate to them. You can take care of them. You can feed them. You can bathe them. You can change their diapers, change their clothes and everything. But by no means could they communicate. Could they talk with these babies? And I'm sure that for most of us, we're like right now in our age, I mean... I know that there is some mamas out there who, whose blood is boiling just from this illustration, right? Because how could they dare do that, right? I mean, that's child abuse. It is. It is. It is. It's child abuse. And so, but what they did, it was hard for them, but they obeyed the orders that were given to them. And do you want to know what the results were? The results were that within several months, each and every baby died. This is something that we need to understand that communication, our words, our language are important. That God not only created us to be in unity and community, he created us for communication. Without communication, death can ensue upon our lives. So what we need to do, what I want us to look at is the importance of communication and see how it is critically important for us that know that that good communication leads to good community. Good communication leads to good community. And, and I am not trying to pick on men here by any means. I know there's some men like, I know he's going to start coming after me. We're not. We're talking about us as a whole that we as believers in Christ must have good communication if we want to be in good community and unity with other believers in Christ. For unity and community to develop their needs to be community. And this is something something important, something that is key, a key component, component in the Genesis story. Genesis 11, 1 through 9, the Tower of Babel. Look again at verses 1 and verse 6. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. What is the major connection for the people being one? That something that God notices, that God takes note of, is that their communication, their language was one. One language builds community. Communi- good communication builds good community. And it took a common language. And I'm not talking about... I'm not talking about languages of this word like like English or Spanish or any other languages. But I want to ask us this morning, what does your language say about you? What does your communication, your speech say about you? I'm sure most of us have noticed that, that where the region or place or area within the United States or wherever you might be listening or watching from, that when you stay in that region or area, for the most part, it doesn't sound like anybody sounds different than you, right? 
You guys all kind of sound, we all kind of sound the same. But when someone comes from a different region, a different place, and they begin to speak, you can tell that they came from a different place just by the way they talk, right? Because they have an accent. There's a lot of accents that we have in the United States. I know some of the, the, the bigger ones, there's the New York accent, there's the Bostonian, there's uh, the Southern Draw, there's the Bayou down in Louisiana. Even throughout the English-speaking world, there's, there's the different accents that we hear. We, we live in Pacific Northwest, so what's the one that's common to us? There's Canada, eh? There's a eh? Canada. What, there's, there's Australian, good day, mate. You know, all the different ones. Then there's the British English. There's the crikey. There, there, there's so many different ones. Blimey. me. All these different accents that we hear about. And I want to ask us again, what does your language, your speech say about you? I remember when I moved up from Southern California, something became very evident to me is that I had an accent from Southern California. I would say like almost after every word, every other word, it was like, you know, like, and I sounded like a teenage girl from Southern California. And I had to stop that. I had to change my accent because people would, couldn't take me seriously, right? So I had to change it. I had to change the way I talk. And I think I might still have that issue. I don't know. Let me know if I still say like all the time. Anyway, Proverbs eighteen twenty one says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat of its fruit. What are your words saying about you? What is your language? What is your speech? What is your accent saying about us? We hear, see here in Proverbs 18.20 that death and life are in the power of the tongue. What are the words that we are saying? What is that accent that we are speaking with? Is there a negative accent or is there a positive accent? Or is it an accent that, that speaks and, and, and is predominantly building up or tearing down? Is it positive or negative? Is it life or is it death? Are we encouraging with our words or are we discouraging with our words? One of the things that, that, that we can tend to do is that we can either voice all that is wrong or we say all that is right kind of a thing. And this is something that... Uh, if I can be just transparent, this is something that I continually am working on myself, that Emily helps me throughout the day sometimes, because sometimes when, when with my children, that they could be either doing schoolwork that I'm helping them with, they're doing yard work, they're doing a project, whatever it might be, playing a sport, that I can focus on the areas that they need help in, Right. Those are the things that I see is the things that they're doing wrong, the things that are negative. And when I begin to focus on that and I begin to speak those things that they need help in, that, and I, then I focus on the negative aspect of their schoolwork or, or, or their play and the way they're playing the sport or other chores around the house, that that is discouraging. Amen. That that can be a discouragement to them. And what happens is that could cause them to just feel defeated. It could cause them to just quit, up and quit. But if I focus on the things that they're doing right, the things that are positive, it begins to encourage them. It begins to build them up. And that is, as believers, the speech, the way we talk, the accent of faith is to be able to speak life into people. It's to build up. It's to encourage. It's, it's to be able to not tear down, but encourage those people. Ephesians 4.29 New Living says, Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Don't use foul, don't use abusive language, right? It says, let everything you say be good and helpful. All right, good and helpful. This is the accent. This is the language of believers. When you speak, when you talk, is it good language? Is it helpful language or is it hurtful? Is it bad? Is it tearing down? Is it negative we're to have good and helpful language and speech. It also says that we're to be an encouragement to those who hear us. Are people encouraged when we come around or are they discouraged? 
Are the words that we are speaking, does it cause them to, to maybe lighten their load and to be able to be open and transparent with us? Or does it cause others to, to start to shut down and be discouraged and walk away? Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Our speech as believers is to be with the grace. Graceful speech. That's the accent. That's the language of believers. That it's with grace. What does grace do? It, it, it empowers us. The grace of God empowers us. Amen? To be able to live like we could only dream and imagine. Seasoned with salt. That we are seasoning others with our language that we're preserving that we're making them better by the way that we talk again this is building unity by the way that we speak unity in our church unity in our marriages unity in our families in our workplace in community as a whole that they're to be seasoned with salt seasoned with grace good helpful encouraging I remember my last job that I had before I became a pastor. I was working as a maintenance mechanic here in town. And uh, I, I had given my, my, my resignation as I was moving forward to, to full-time pastoring. And I think it was like the last week before I actually left. We were kind of in the shop. We were standing around, me and the guys and stuff like that. We are just cutting it up and stuff. And one of them said... They, 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 they made this, this statement and they said, when you leave, who is going to calm everyone down and keep us all together? That is what they said to me. And that, you know, that's an encouragement. That's, you know, something that, that I found. I was like, man, that, that, that's a compliment. But who, who are, who's going to calm us down? Who's going to keep us together? That is what they attributed to me. Because that is the way I came across. That I was trying to keep everyone together because if anyone's worked in that type of atmosphere, any type, you've worked in not only in a maintenance atmosphere or in, in a cubicle atmosphere, in a corporate atmosphere, that everyone is looking for their them out for themselves, right? That's like what people are trying to do. Trying to one-up each other, trying to get the next promotion, trying to be better than other people. Hey, look at me. But as believers, are we trying to bring everyone back together? Bring unity within the organization. Unity within that sphere of influence. And that was attributed to my life. And I'm not trying, hey, look how good I am, right? Because I'm still working on it, even within my own family. But that is something that they were able to identify to my life. I want to ask that for you. Is that an identifier of your life? Are you bringing people back together? Are you bringing encouragement? Are you calming everyone down? Or are you the one that is actually causing the division? Causing the isolation? Causing the separation with the words that you're speaking? We are to bring unity. We're to bring oneness. We're to bring calmness and comfort by our words. What we see in 1 Corinthians, this letter that Paul wrote, his first letter to the Corinthian church, is the negative aspect of words. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 1.10. We see that the opposite of this principle played out. And he says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Know that division of language leads to division of community. Division of language leads to division of community. One of the issues that Paul was addressing at the very beginning of this letter was the issue of unity within the Corinthian church. Now, if you know anything about church history or learned anything about church history or the early Corinthian church, you know that they had a lot going on in that church, right? A lot more bad than there was good. And so Paul um, kind of caught wind of all that was taking place in this church that he started. And so he pens, he writes this letter inspired by the Holy Spirit and sends it off to the Corinthian church. 
And what he begins to do as he writes this letter, he begins with the very the importance and the key factor of unity within the church. Again, we as believers must see the importance of unity within the brethren, within brothers and sisters in Christ, that we need to maintain unity, that it's something that we need to war for, that we need to fight for, that we need to get over differences, we need to get over offenses, so that we can maintain this level of unity. So Paul is speaking directly to the issue at hand. It's not the symptoms... He's, he's speaking to the actual issue at hand. So before, as he's talking about unity, before he talks about all the junk that was happening, all the, the doctrinal errors, all the, the perversion that was taking place, all the divisiveness of, of people trying to say that they were more, uh, more spiritually superior to others within the church, before he even gets to all of that in his letter, the first thing we see as he addresses unity in the first chapter of this letter, he writes, he has them focus on their speech, on their language, on their communication. Because community communication is vital for good community. He says again in verse 10, now I plead with you that you all speak the same thing and there be no divisions among you. What some of the people were doing is, is they were saying, oh, we're of, uh, one was from Apollos, one was from Paul, one was from Cephas or Peter. There was these different divisions and they were voicing their opinions, they're voicing their different beliefs, all these different things and it was causing division within the church and he's like, no, 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 no. You gotta work on your language, work on the way you speak. Speak in ways that bring unity and build others up instead of, instead of isolation. So the key to addressing unity within this divided church, Paul focused on their speech. The, one of the major areas that he attributed to this division was in the way they spoke. Jesus says this in Luke 6, 45. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. If you have a good heart, good words will come out. If you have an evil heart, evil things will come out. It all comes back to heart issue. How is your heart? What is in your heart? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is coming out of your mouth? Again, let me ask you, what, are, what is your words saying about you? What is the language, the speech, the accent saying about you? I want to ask you, is there an abundance of Jesus in your heart? Are we speaking with love? Are we speaking with acceptance? Are we speaking uh, uh, of, uh, with encouragement, with life? Jesus spoke words of life, not death. He brought encouragement, right? There was correction, but it was an encouragement to help them get better. So are the words that we are speaking, do they bring life. And if they're not, if we find that our language is negative, if it's divisive, if it causes separation and isolating, we need to look to ourselves, all right? And we need to ask Holy Spirit to begin and continue to change our heart so that we can speak positive because it's a heart issue. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And the only one that can change your heart is the Holy Spirit coming in indwelling you, making his home there and beginning to do housework, cleaning up, changing your heart. It's a heart issue. Going back to the Tower of Babel real quick, Genesis eleven seven, 7, we see God speaking. It says, come, let us go down. And there, confuse their language, we see again the, the Trinity within the type of language. He's speaking to himself and he says, come let us. So we see that there's a plural oneness within the Godhead. It says, let us go down and there confuse their language. Excuse me. And that they may not understand one another's speech. God understood the power of words, the power of language. And he noticed their pride and arrogance and he, the way he broke all this up, all this unity up, was he confused their language. Something that we see played out within the Corinthian church. 
that confusion of language leads to confusion of community. God brought confusion within their language and it brought confusion in community and it caused them to disperse and spread out. Again, division of language leads to division of communication of community. Communication isn't just recommended for unity, it's required. Let me say that again. Communication isn't just recommended for unity, it's required. Are you taking the time to be able to call someone through this pandemic, even though we're not able to see each other as much? And I know this Sunday, we canceled our church on the lawn service because of the smoke and the poor air quality that was going on. But are we taking the time through it all to communicate to call other brothers and sisters within the church, other brothers and sisters in Christ, and seeing how they're doing, encouraging, because communication is recommended and required for unity to take place and for unity to develop. And I want to go back to 1 Corinthians 1.10, and I want to look at it in the New Living, because there I find we find our third point for communication this morning. As we close, it says, Paul in the New Living, I appeal to you to live in harmony with each other. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. So I kind of want to, to bring these two verses, it, it, the, the, the one verse from the different in the New King James and in the New Living. Because what we see here in the New Living, he says, I appeal to you to live in harmony with other. That's the same idea where Paul is saying that you all speak the same thing. So we see that for us to speak the same thing in the new living, it kind of translates it to living in harmony. Are we speaking in the same language? Are we speaking words of love, words of encouragement? Because that is what, what, that is what we see that brings harmony within the body of Christ. The, the best illustration for this word harmony is like an orchestra. I don't know if you have ever been able to, to see an orchestra in person or maybe on TV on one of their PBS specials, right? That's probably like the only time someone would actually flip through the channels and see it. But I remember when Emily, she, uh, she majored in music. So when we were dating, she was in college and we went to different musical uh, uh arrangements I guess you could call it and we went to an orchestra I remember once and and what happens at the very beginning when you come into the orchestra everyone is practicing right they're down in the front and center in their little thing and you're looking at them and you're like man this sounds horrible you hear the different horns the different strings the different instruments they're all playing out of tune and everything is going on but what happens when the conductor comes up and he hits his baton on the stand all of a sudden there's quietness there's calmness and he begins and all of a sudden everything they practice, all the music begins to sound together. They're, the people playing different instruments, different sounds are all melting together and making this beautiful music that will give you goosebumps and, and cause your hair to stand on end because it's in harmony. It's, it's in melody, that it's coming together. That is for us, the body of Christ, that we are to be in harmony. But leading into this third point, little rabbit trail there, at the very end of 1 Corinthians 1.10 in the New Living, he says, rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. My third point, final point this morning, is being united in language takes being united in purpose. Being united in language takes being united in purpose. And one of the great mistakes of this story of the Tower of Babel is that even though the people, they had one language and they were united, the way they spoke is they spoke of themselves and their own plans and purposes. That is what, is, that is what caused the issue with the Tower of Babel, with the confusion of language, is they were focused on themselves and their own plans and purposes and not on what God's plans and purposes for them was. Look again at Genesis 11.4. It says, And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. Even though they were united, which is good, they were united in their own purposes. And their main purposes for all this building is in that text. The reason why they did it is so that they wouldn't be scattered abroad. They wouldn't 
be scattered abroad, but that they would be able to come together. But what was God's plan? What was God's purpose? What was God's word, not only to Adam, but also to Noah? Because these are all the descendants of Noah now, right? What was God's commandment to Noah? Genesis 1.9 It says, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. That was God's purpose for humanity. So they were able to be fruitful. They're multiplying. They were growing in number, right? They, build a, they built a city. But what did they do? They stuck to themselves. They stay huddled together. Instead of spreading out, they built this huge city with a huge tower in it, all for themselves. Last week, we talked on unity in the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17. And we were able to discover three things. We saw how, how, how uh, what creates unity, remember belief, what the, was the purpose for unity, and also the power of unity, God's love. But do you remember what is the purpose for unity? What is the biblical purpose for our unity? Do you remember it's so that the world will know that the Father sent the Son, that the Father sent Jesus, that He sent a Savior, so that people will be able to come into contact with the body of Christ and meet the head who is the Savior, who is Jesus. What we as the believers, we are coming together, not so that we can be huddled up, not so that we can be hidden, not so that we can be isolated, but we are to actually be dispersed as we are in, with in unity. And the church, that as believers, we are called to be the, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We're not to be called isolated in a cave so no one can find us. We're to be able to, to shine a bright light so others would be able to see us. And in seeing us, coming into contact with us, they would come into contact with God himself. That they would find love, that they would find acceptance, that they would find forgiveness, and ultimately find eternal life through Jesus that is what we, that is the purpose of our unity. If that is not the purpose of our unity, then it will show up in your language. It'll show up in our language. That will be so focused on self. Let's try and build up this church for ourselves. Let's try and make a name for ourselves here in Toppenish at Hope for the Nation. No, that is not our purpose. It's to be fruitful and multiply, yes, but it's to fill the lower valley. That we would be able to make a name for God and not ourselves. Amen. That, that we need to know that the way we communicate internally is what will be communicated externally. Let me say that again. The way we communicate internally is what will be communicated externally. Are we only focused on ourselves in trying to maintain this level of unity or are we focusing on the external aspect of the gospel, the evangelistic aspect of the gospel, of filling the earth, of spreading the gospel? Because what will take place is we'll just grow, we'll just think about ourselves internally and people will begin to see that. That we're not interested in people outside because we're only interested in people inside. But if we have a heart for God's purpose evangelistically, they will see that love upon us, that we have a love for other people that are outside the four walls of the church and be drawn in through community. What was the issue with the people of Babel? That they focused on themselves and not on God. And it showed up in their language. Again, is what, it, what, is, what is our language saying about it? Is our language, our communication, our speak, our accent only about ourselves or is it about God? And God's purposes is God in our words is God in our dialect dialect in our dialogue when we come together as the body of Christ not only on a Sunday morning when we're doing life together when we're calling each other we're seeing each other throughout the week is God in our conversation 
Communication that brings biblical unity should be centered upon God. A language that focuses upon God and his word and his purposes. Revelations, last, last, last uh, scripture here for us. Revelations 12, 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even to death. Is your testimony, do you have a testimony first and foremost about Jesus coming in, saving you? Are you a believer in Christ? If you are, you have a testimony. And that is how these believers, it says, and they, speaking of believers, this is key for us. How do we overcome in this world? And they overcame him. Who's him? Satan, the God of this world. How do we live as overcomers in this world? How do we live victorious in this world? Quick three points. Blood of the Lamb. Jesus' life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension into heaven that we believe upon him that creates unity through belief, through belief in his blood that it cleanses us of all sin, shame, everything. And we believe in him. So it's through the blood of the lamb. And it's by the word of our testimony. And they did not love their lives unto death. But the word of your testimony. Are you sharing it? Are you standing upon it? Do you remember your testimony? The way we remember our testimony is, is when we share our testimony. That it reminds us that we are saved. That we have this relationship. That we have been renewed. That we have been given eternal life. Jesus is to be the center of our language. Jesus is at the center of our testimony and it has brought victory in our lives and it will continue to bring victory. So what would it look like if Jesus was the focus of our speech? We would begin to sound the same. Our accent would be the same. If Jesus was the center of our speech and language, it would sound like victory. It would sound like overcoming. It would sound like thriving. It would sound like encouragement. It would sound like life. It would sound like being a positive, like building up. And our words would always point back to Jesus. Is Jesus in our speech and in our words? Remember Luke 6, 45, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Is Jesus abundant in your heart this morning? One of the ways we as believers, as the church, causes that, that idea and Jesus being abundant in our heart, it's, it's through sharing our testimony. Telling other people about what a God has done in and through our lives. It also comes through remembering that before you can tell about it, you have to remember it. And this morning as we move into communion, that is what communion does. It causes us to remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said the night he was betrayed when he instituted the Lord's Supper, when he instituted community, communion. He said, do this in remembrance of me. As we partake of communion this morning, allow the Holy Spirit to remind you, to cause you to remember Jesus of your testimony, what he has taken you from and what he's taken you through and know that he is continually leading you through all the way to the end until he comes and when we meet him face to face in all his glory. Let's partake of communion this morning in this time of remembrance. Let's partake of this cracker that represents the bread that he broke and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples, which represents his body. Let's partake. And this juice that represents the wine, which he said was his blood that was poured out for many. Because we know that without his blood, there can't be forgiveness and remission of sins. So we need to be reminded of what he took upon his body, upon the cross, through his blood, we can be forgiven and come into eternal life and this relationship with him. Let's partake together. Amen. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love that you loved us with. That empowers us to live in unity. We thank you for 
Jesus, your son, whom you have given to us through that powerful love. That we have been translated, we have been changed from the old, from the dark, from the depressed and the shame-filled into the light, into your family, into your love, into an encouraging family, into a family that builds up and speaks life. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to remind us as we're going through this unity series and as we are uniting our hearts as one in the body of Christ, that you would continue to cause us to remember our words, that our words have the power of life and death, and that we would make the choice to speak life, to speak encouragement, to build up, to edify and not tear down. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys.